In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things that we know and make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, verse 27. Matthew chapter 24, verse 27. Some of this we've gone over, but we're going to move on. 2427. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, that is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. And uh, some points on lightning. First of all, lightning travels at great speed. Lightning, uh, lightning travels, of course, at the speed of light, at great speed. It can be seen by everyone. That is, if you're not blind, you can see lightning. And Revelation 1.4 talks about how everyone will see this. It warns of a co coming storm. Lightning always warns of a coming storm. And this storm will be uh, like no other, the baptism of fire judgment. This storm will be the baptism of fire judgment. It disturbs and frightens people. Oftentimes, lightning disturbs and frightens people. In the same way, the coming of our Lord will disturb and frighten millions upon millions upon millions of people. Then in 2428, as soon as this occurs, what, what happens? There's a, there's a type of bleep here. All of a sudden, we go from lightning to carcass. Well, I'll tell you what happens. Our Lord comes and slaughters people by the millions upon millions upon millions upon millions. People are slaughtered. And in Revelation, it says that so many people are slaughtered that the blood will run as high as the, the, the bridle on a horse for 175 miles. That's some killing right there. And that's what our Lord does to preserve the freedom of Israel. Principle, only way to have freedom, kill the enemy. And we should be making blood run deep in some areas of the world so that we can maintain our freedom. But this is something different, something in which our Lord is going to take over, in which our Lord is going to be the King of kings and Lord of lords, and He's going to wipe out so many people that blood is going to run all the way as high as the horse's bridle. You know, you walk a horse down the street and you got its bridle, well, there's the blood. And for 170 miles, that's how deep the blood's going to be. A tremendous thing that's going to happen. And this is what occurs between 24-7 and 24-8. The silence there is, uh, well, there's silence there, but this is exactly what happens. And in 24-28, it says, Wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will be gathered. All those birds that like to uh, pick at cadavers, they're going to have a field day picking at all the human beings laying around. They'll be dead, unbelievers dead, and uh, all the uh, vultures will be going around picking at the flesh of the dead. And in fact, whatever they can't clean up, it's going to take six months to remove all the dead bodies that's found in Revelation. Six whole months before, uh, as they move into the millennium, it's going to take six months before they can remove all the dead carcasses and get them out of the way so they don't cause disease and such as that. So what we have here is the second advent and what occurs. And it is our Lord about to bring freedom to Israel and, of course, bring in the millennial reign of Christ. And what we have from wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will be gathered. This is the great slaughter of the Armageddon campaign. 
Now the Armageddon campaign is phenomenal. And it actually includes four forces. And you remember the abomination of desolation. In the abomination of desolation, uh, they would... Uh, uh, Israel sought refuge in the Roman, the revived Roman Empire, the United States of Western Europe. It would be Western Europe. And they seek shelter in Western Europe. Now what happens all of a sudden after they seek shelter in Western Europe? The kings of the east, who are very powerful by this time, start to roll across the land and move toward Israel. This disturbs the Russians. So the Russians start to come down from the north. And then, of course, the king of the south, the pan-Arabic bloc, sees all this happening. They want to get in on the action, so they can come in from the south. And then the king of the west uh, finally says, Well, you will not uh, take this strategic point. We must have this strategic point. So the king of the west, Johnny come, come lately, comes in at the last moment. But they're not coming in to deliver Israel. They're coming in to take them over. So the whole world is going to be against Israel in this battle of Armageddon. But actually this battle contains four different battles. A battle against the king of the east in which they will actually move into part of Jerusalem. A battle over the king of the north who tries to get into Jerusalem. A battle of the king of the south trying to get into Jerusalem. And also the king of the west, Johnny Come Lately, they also will try to get in there and, and move in and have a piece of Jerusalem in which they can take control of that so important Suez Canal. And that's what's going to happen, and that is the Armageddon. It's a, it's a campaign, it's a series of battles, four battles, in fact. <clears throat> so then in 24... 29, it says this, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, immediately after, meaning they've been going, the believers in Jesus Christ who have been holed out in the mountains, or the ones who have been fighting in the second half of the tribulation, all of whom have followed the word of God specifically, and immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. Now, I don't mean a cloud's going to come over or a thunderstorm's going to come up. The sun will be turned black. There will be no light. And I can tell you this because it goes on and says, and the moon will not reflect its light. The moon will not reflect its light. Where does the moon reflect its light from? The sun. The sun will be black. The moon will be black. There will be a supernatural darkness all over the earth. Just as there was a supernatural darkness all over the earth for the three hours that our Lord received the judgment of all of our sins, being imputed to Him and judged. So the two reasons for this blackout are, it's twofold. First of all, it's for the protection of the Jewish forces that are holed up in Jerusalem. They're about to be wiped out, but they have enough faith to know, keep fighting. Keep fighting, for the King of kings and Lord of lords is about to come down and do our bidding for us. So let us keep on fighting. So that's the one reason for the blackout, to protect the Jews. The second reason is an analogy to the cross. And when our Lord was on the cross for three hours, there was supernatural darkness. Now at night it's dark, but you can see, and your eyes can adjust. And uh, there are certain light. You can look up in the sky and see uh, stars on a clear night. Even on cloudy nights, there's not total darkness because the lights of the city reflect off the clouds. But uh, in this day, complete darkness, no light whatsoever, and uh, an abnormal type darkness. The meteors will fall from heaven there's going to be an increase of celestial activity. Well, the very fact that the whole universe is going to go black and then having an increase of celestial activity is nothing uh, that... It could be a, a side effect of that, but who knows, but it's going to happen. And meteors will fall from heaven and come into the earth's atmosphere and crash onto the earth. And the powers of heaven 
will be shaken. All of this occurs at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second advent. This is not the resurrection. Now, a lot of pastors get confused and say this is resurrection material and this is how it's going to occur. No. The resurrection is going to be in the blink of an eye. We'll all be here and then poof, we'll all be gone. And we'll hear the trumpet, no one else will, but poof, we'll be gone. Face to face with the Lord. In a place of no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death, the old things have passed away. And then in 2430, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Now this does not have to do with the resurrection because remember, the church isn't even formed yet. Uh, there's been prophecy concerning the church, but he's talking to the disciples and all the others, and none of these things have happened yet. And uh, the, the Son of Man, it just refers to the fact of Jesus Christ. So then the sign of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, will appear in heaven. And all the tribes of the land will mourn. If you have the King James, I guess it says mourn. That's uh, huh. Now why would they mourn at the coming of Jesus Christ, these believers? They're not mourning. They are crying tears of joy. The, the translators of the uh, King James Version are like men who don't understand that sometimes women cry out of joy. Women cry out of joy. And guess what? Both man and woman will cry out of joy when they see the Son of Man. When the Son of Man appears in heaven, all the tribes of the land will cry tears of joy. That's what's really going to occur. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power. And that power is to regather them into the land. And they also see power and great glory. Now, not all Israel, even at this point, is gathered into the land. They're still spread apart. They're still under the fifth cycle of discipline. And even though this is the tribulation, there will be Jews living in the United States. Some believers, some not. Well, whatever the United States would be probably the United States of Mexico by then or something like that. And then uh, 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 Europe would be something else. And uh, Well, it might be a whole different type of uh, history going on, but everyone is going to see this occur, and all the Jews are going to be gathered. And not just the unbelieving, this is interesting, but uh, both believing and unbelieving Jews are going to be gathered into the land. How this occurs is not really specified in Scripture. I've looked for it, and the fact is, all the Jews, whether saved or unsaved, they're all going to go back to the land at this point, at this point of the regathering. And, in 2431, and he will send, and we'll deal with this later, because uh, some Jews are going to stay, and... And, and go into the millennium, and some Jews are going to go to hell. And we'll see that. 2431, And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet blast, and they will gather his elect. Now this isn't our resurrection. This is the resurrection of the Jews. Not the Jews of the church age. These are the resurrection of the Jews of the Old Testament and the resurrection of of Jewish martyrs in uh, the time of the tribulation. And I'll tell you why. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet blast. And they will gather his elect. This will be the resurrection of dead, born-again Jews of the entire Jewish race. All the Jewish race, except for those Jews in the church age, all of those Jews who believed in Christ, this will be the resurrection of Abraham, this will be the resurrection of David, this will be the resurrection of Moses, this will be the resurrection of those martyrs in the tribulation. 
So the resurrection of dead, born-again Jews of the entire Jewish race, not including the church age Jews, because if a church, if someone in the church age is racially a Jew and they believe in Christ, they don't, they lose their race. Remember, we're not Gentile anymore. We're royal family of God. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we become royalty. And when a Jew believes in Jesus Christ in this age, they become royalty. This deals with other ages. It deals with the tribulation and the Old Testament. Therefore, this will be the resurrection of Old Testament saints along with the saints of the tribulation. And there is a reason that this has come to be known. I mean, there's a reason, there's a following of logic that uh, follows this. Because right now, the only person ever resurrected right now is our Lord Jesus Christ. No one else in all of human history has ever been resurrected except our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ has been resurrected. Point one. Now, the second thing that's going to occur, the next resurrection, is the resurrection of the church. All of this is found throughout Scripture. I won't go through it right now, but the second thing that happens is the resurrection of the church. Whenever the church age ends, we have the resurrection of the church. Now, at the second advent, that is when our Lord comes down uh, to deliver the Jews from the attack of all the armies of the north, south, east, and west, when he comes down and delivers them, uh, and then that occurs, after that occurs, there will be the resurrection of the past, uh, of the past uh, Old Testament saints, as well as the Jews who were martyred in the tribulation. They will be resurrected. And uh, there are some ways to come at this to say, well, how do you know that's right? How do you know that this isn't uh, the resurrection of the church? as just being uh, de de delineated in a different way. And I'll tell you why. Because in Acts chapter 2, 25 through 29, we have Peter's Pentecostal sermon. That's the only time I'll refer to a Pentecostal with a smile on my face. Peter's Pentecostal sermon. And it was because he spoke in tongues and so did everyone else. And it was on the day of Pentecost, 30 A.D., so in Acts 2:25 through 29 we have Peter's Pentecostal sermon. Now in this sermon what does he say? If you flip there you'll see what he says. I'm skipping a lot. And you don't have to flip there, but the only point I'm trying to make out of this is that David is still in the tomb. They call it a sepulcher. It's a sepulcher. Meaning that David had not been resurrected. Our Lord had been resurrected. David still in the tomb. The Old Testament saints had not been resurrected. Now when we get to Matthew 27, we're going to see something of Old Testament saints being resuscitated and they're going to be walking around in the city and then bloof up to heaven they go. But that's resuscitation and then they go to heaven. And they're not resurrected. There's a difference. And we'll get to that in Matthew 27. So the reason, so Peter makes it clear right here, David is still in his sepulcher. David is still in his tomb. He's not resurrected. And when our Lord was resurrected, no one else was resurrected with him. All the Old Testament saints were, were, not, were not resurrected with him. And we'll get into more detail about this uh, later on. Now Moses and Elijah. Here's another way to come at it. We all know, or we shouldn't, well, we will know once we get to studying this. And during the time of the tribulation, Moses and Elijah are going to come back. And they're going to come back to evangelize in the tribulation. And both of them will be killed. People will kill them, and they'll be resuscitated. But people are going to kill Moses and Elijah in the tribulation when they come back. So what can we say about that? Well, we can say if they were resurrected, there's no way they could die. The resurrection body is immortal. We have mortal bodies, and when we're resurrected, we put on immortality, meaning we cannot 
die ever again. Yet Moses and Elijah come back and they die again. And you say, why would somebody want to do that? Well, they're serving the Lord and uh, believe me, they have their rewards and that's just the way it is. That's just the way it's going to happen. They're going to come back and they're going to die and they're going to face death for a second time. They're probably the only two people on the face of the earth to ever die twice, Moses and Elijah. Moses went up on the mountain, dropped dead. Then Moses is going to come down in tribulation and preach the gospel and uh, somebody will kill him and then he'll be resuscitated. But this means he hasn't been resurrected. And if he had been resurrected, then he would have a resurrection body in which he could put on immortality and no one would be able to kill him. Do you know when the resurrection comes and we all go to be with the Lord? We'll never die. We have immortality. Our bodies are immortal. And that's for us as believers. As unbelievers, you too at the last judgment receive a resurrection body. And it's immortal. And it will handle all the pain in the world for eternity. And you'll never die. And you'll experience pain for an eternity. Terrible thing to think about, but they made their choice. So that's the second way to say that the, the, the only resurrection that has occurred is our Lord's, and therefore there is, there's been no one ever resurrected uh, before or since our Lord Jesus Christ until we are resurrected. And we get this from Acts 2, 25, 29, Peter's Pentecostal sermon talking about David still in the grave. We get it from Moses and Elijah who die. If they had resurrection bodies, they wouldn't have died. And also, the, the next way we could look at it is the dispensation of Israel is not yet completed. Even today, the dispensation of Israel is not yet completed. Neither is the dispensation of the church age. What happens at the conclusion of the dispensation of the church age? All of us go straight to heaven or in the clouds, in the air, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, excuse me, forever. I didn't even eat spaghetti yet, and still I have ant acid or whatever. Not ant acid, but real acid. I need ant acid. But uh, they, uh, bloop, they go to heaven. Resurrection. And that hasn't happened for us, so the only person ever resurrected is Jesus Christ. And our dispensation is not complete, but when it is complete, we will be resurrected. And the dispensation of Israel is not complete, but when it is complete, resurrection. When is it going to be complete? At the end of the seven years of the tribulation. And then there will be a resurrection of Old Testament saints and a resurrection of those martyrs who martyred themselves in the tribulation. Now, some of those martyrs martyred themselves uh, with great righteousness. Others of them, others of those people became martyrs because they were stupid. Remember, uh, they were told to run to the hills. As soon as you see the abomination of desolation, you get on your high horse and you run to the hills. Some of them don't know enough doctrine to do it. So they keep wandering around the city and somebody comes up to them like they did in Hitler's Germany and says, are you a Jew, are you a Jew? But instead this time they say, are you a Christian? I think you're a Christian. And then shoom, they're dead. And they're a martyr. And they go to heaven, but they're a loser in their spiritual life. And those two will be resurrected at that point, and all that has to do with grace. So now we move to the parable of the fig tree. The parable of the fig tree. Now this is different. And we've had the parable of the fig tree before, but this one's coming at a different angle. You remember the first parable of the fig tree? The disciples thought our Lord was pissed at the tree. Remember that? Well, He was and he was just uh, making a point. And now we have another parable of a fig tree. And 24.32 starts like this. I like the way it starts because it says, Learn this parable from the fig tree. Whenever its branch is about to sprout and put on leaves, now the sprouting branch deals with the second advent. 
leaves are Israel's evangelism in the tribulation. Remember, in the tribulation, at the, at the very start, there's going to be 144,000 evangelists. And you say, how do they become evangelists? Well, there's going to be a lot of smart Jews who uh, look at all the things that occur at the resurrection. And they see all the church age believers zoom up into heaven. And there's going to be some smart Jews who have been studying their Torah and others in other parts of the scripture. And they're going to look at that and they're going to say, you know what? People have told me about this before and I know what this means. This means that Jesus Christ has come and has uh, taken up his church and we were all wrong and we should have believed. And so they'll look into their scripture. They'll start to look at the New Testament for the first time. Uh, uh, at least 144,000 of them will. And they'll start to go to John 3.16 and they'll start to believe in, or they will believe in Christ. And a lot of these will become witnesses. And they will say they were right. We never believed the Messiah had already come, but He had. And He already took up His church, and we believe, and you need to believe. And so there will be 144,000 evangelists running all over Israel trying to evangelize everyone right there. So that's the first phase of evangelism, and these leaves, as we see here, learn this parable from the fig tree. Whenever its branch is about to sprout and put on leaves, these leaves are Israel's evangelism in the tribulation. Then it goes on to say, you know that summer is near. We always associate summer with good times, and I guess they do too. You know that the millennium is near, is what it's saying. You know that the summer is near. The millennium is near. School's about to be let out. I guess that's the best way to describe it, especially if you hate school. School's about to be let out. The millennium is here. And that's how they're uh, saying it. Then in 2432, 33, so too... When you see all these things, you know that he is near at the gates. A point of truth, or verily, verily means a point of doctrine, verily. This race, this Jewish race, will not pass away until all these things occur. There are so many principles that come out of 2434 that... Uh, I could talk to you until 2 o'clock tonight. I won't. Don't freak out. But I could, out of this one verse, uh, just to let you know the importance of it. And this is what it says. A point of doctrine. This Jewish race will not pass away until all things occur. And all things that he's talking about are all the prophecies that uh, God has made. And what has our Lord said concerning the Jew? Our Lord has said concerning the Jew, they're going to go into the millennium. They're going to be a Jewish client nation. There are going to be so many Jews all over the earth, it's, it's going to be phenomenal. That's what our Lord says. And what does Satan do? When, when Satan sees a promise from God, immediately he's going to try to discredit that promise. He's going to try to make out as if God is a liar. And God said, hey, these Jews on the earth, even now in the church age, they're going to be here all the way through the tribulation. And even though, look at this, and even though all the armies of the earth, the king of the west, the king of the south, the king of the east, the king of the north, even though all these people are going to attack the Jew, they're still going to survive. And he made that promise. And he made that promise, not just now, but uh, under the Abrahamic promise, under the Davidic covenant. He made that promise thousands upon thousands of years ago. And ever since then, Satan has been trying to wipe out the Jew. Why do you think big people like Hitler rise to power? What did Hitler want to do? He wanted to wipe out the Jew. 
he was satanically influenced, if not satanically uh, uh, possessed, and he wanted to wipe out all the Jews in the human race. And he got to wipe out six million of them, but Jews are still here today, and he's burning in hell. God is faithful, and that's the point. And uh, we have uh, Stalin in Russia. He killed 30 million of his own people. He killed more people than Hitler could ever dream of, but he also had anti-Semitism and wanted to wipe out Jews as well. And he wiped out as many Jews as he could, and today he's burning in hell. God keeps his promises, and that's the point. And here is another promise to the Jew, as if they need it anymore. They've been given promise after promise. Here's another promise, a point of truth, verily. This Jewish race will not pass away until all these things occur. 2435. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, will never pass away. And he has given a promise to the Jews so that they will survive the tribulation and they will go into the millennium. But a point to get out of this is this. Out of all the things in the world that you might admire, out of all the things in this world that you love, his word does not pass away. You might, uh, it's normal. I'm not down on you and saying you're sinning because of it. There are things in this world that are enjoyable. For example, I, I purchased for myself uh, a remote control airplane that I am going to fly. And I finally looked into it, and there's a little group that flies it over near the uh, Honeywell place. And uh, they fly planes, and I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to learn how to do it. It's going to be my hobby. It's going to be something fun for me to do. Instead of being cooped up in a house all day, you get kind of crazy if you stay in a house all day, all the time. So I said, I need a hobby. I need to have something to do, you know, to, to break in, in between all the study. So I'm going to fly this plane. And uh, over here at Honeywell, they've got instructors, and they'll teach me how so that I don't crash this equipment and lose all the money. And all of that's fun and part of life, And uh, but it's very fleeting, and I know that. Everything in life that we do for fun is very fleeting. Now, I'm not saying you can't have fun, watch movies, do this. That would be legalistic. But what I am telling you is that uh, everything in this world will pass away. Heaven is going to pass away at some point. Earth is going to pass away. But my word will never pass away. What is the one thing that you can get in your soul that will never pass away? The word of God. And that brings out the importance of the word of God and living your life in the light of eternity. If you make Bible doctrine number one priority in your life, as you should, you are storing something in your soul that never passes away. You know, if you got your the most uh, wonderful gift uh, that some of you could get right now might be a brand new car, maybe a uh, Mustang, maybe one of those brand new sleek looking Mustangs they got coming out. And I do like the way those Mustangs look. I wouldn't mind having one myself. But you know what? In 15 years, passes away. That thing will look like an old clunker, all rusted out, 15 years. Not unless people rebuild it and make it a classic. I mean, they do that sometimes, but uh, eventually everything passes away. Glory passes away. You were a great football player when you were in high school, and then you're riding around in one of those jerry chairs when you're 80. It passed away. It all passed away. All that glory you thought you had, all that wonderful uh, pats on the back about how great you were and how you caught that football. Now the only way you can catch the football is to 
to put a gas engine on that jerry chair. Right up the field. Glory days are gone. And this is what this verse is saying. Heaven and earth will pass away. Even heaven. We look up at the heavens and see the stars. They'll be gone one day, believe it or not. In one big blast. We'll study that in Second Peter. And the earth. We think of the earth as stable and always going to be here. No, nope. one day, boom, it's gone too. But guess what keeps on going? But my word will never pass away. And if you, on the earth right now, take in the word of God and put it in your soul and grow in grace and in knowledge, that's one thing you take with you to heaven and it never passes away. And with that word you receive reward. And those rewards never pass away. It's a phenomenal thing. And this verse, however short it is, really lets it be known the importance of the word of God. Because everything passes away. All those things you're concerned about, they pass away. And I want to tell you something. Some of you aren't too far away from graduation. Well, quite a ways away. But uh, I want you to think on your graduation day, if you can remember, to think in terms of eternity. And I want you to think that when you're walking up and getting your diploma, as you will, and you're smart, you'll get them, and as you're walking up there and you're getting your diploma and you're hearing everybody hollering and clapping, including your parents, and they're probably clapping the most, finally got them through, etc. No more homework for me neither. And once you go through all that, and, uh, and you hear all those humans clapping, just remember that if you fulfilled your spiritual life, angels in heaven clap for you. You don't hear it. You'll never hear it. And uh, But if you're growing in grace and in knowledge, you'll know it. And uh, if you grow in grace and in knowledge and you go to spiritual maturity, guess what? All the angels in heaven stand up and cheer. And there are billions of angels. How many do you have in your class? I don't know. My class was large. I think I had 700. Dorman High School or Dorman University, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but uh, yours might have two, three hundred. I don't know. But we got billions of angels just cheering us on to go to spiritual maturity. Now we're in the world and we should do the best we can in high school. And don't ever let and don't ever say, "Hey, mom, dad, I don't have to worry about the studies because uh, I, I, I'm learning the Word of God and I don't have to worry about my studies." No, Word of God commands you to uh, follow your authorities, and you should. And God will give you enough time to study and learn the Word of God. He'll give you enough time to sit here for an hour or less than. I've been going a little less than lately. Uh, uh, but he'll give you enough time to do that and finish your homework. And you should finish your homework. And you should uh, do your work. In fact, as a Christian, you should be the best at what you do. As, a, as someone who is serving the Lord, as someone who is a Christian, you should... Uh, you should strive to be the best in everything you do because guess what? You're not working as unto that teacher. You might have some teachers you don't like, but you're not working as unto that teacher. You're working as unto the Lord. And if you do the best you can in terms of as, as working unto the Lord and you do your homework, then you're not going to have any regrets and you're going to make it just fine through school and that's temporal. But, also, the angels will stand up and cheer when you grow up enough spiritually to reach spiritual maturity. And the two actually go hand in hand. If you are successful spiritually, you'll be successful in everything else. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. The two are not mutually exclusive. They're mutually inclusive. They go together. Like love and marriage. You learn Bible doctrine. If you learn Bible doctrine and grow in grace, 
it's going to give you the right perspective on authority in which you'll have the right perspective to say, I'll do the best I can in school no matter what a jerk of a teacher I have because you're serving the Lord, not the jerk teacher. And this is, this is all of this, uh, amazingly, all of this comes out of this one verse because it says, but my word will never pass away. That's phenomenal. And it's something that we should all think about, and it's uh, pretty important. So point one, the word of God is more important than heaven and earth. And that's the whole point. The Word of God is more important than heaven and earth. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. The Word of God is still going to be around. Therefore, which is more important? The Word of God. Some people might think I'm a little kooky sometimes, uh, maybe because I uh, love the Word of God so much, or maybe because I want to teach it so much, it just doesn't seem normal. Not you. Why do you make a funny face? I'm just talking in general. Uh, and some people think that, uh, well, you teach the Word of God every day. Nobody does that. Who in the world? That's kind of crazy. But when you see this verse, it ain't that crazy at all whatsoever. Because heaven and earth will pass away. And I could most definitely not be up here today and be enjoying some earthly thing. I could put a big flashlight on the airplane and just fly it all night long and enjoy myself instead of stand up here and teach. But, my word, the word of God, will never pass away. And that means we must live our lives in the light of eternity. And one day when uh, we get to the Bema evaluation, we're going to be evaluated. And that's going to have eternal repercussions. Did you succeed in your spiritual life or did you fail? If you succeeded, you will eternally have rewards. The rewards we we receive today are fleeting, not lasting at all. I used to have some uh, little uh, things I wore for doing something in karate when I was seven or eight. I don't even know where they are now. But when I got them when I was seven or eight, that was it. I was somebody. I had just uh, conquered the world with a karate chop. And I was uh, a great dude. But it went away. And that faded away. And then when I got to high school, I realized I had a proclivity toward music. And I uh, played the violin better than uh, anyone in my class. And uh, and got first chair. I don't know. If you play in the band, you know first, second, third chair. I had first chair ninth through twelfth grade. So there you go. I was good at it. So I was really good at it. But what does it matter now? Nobody remembers me except maybe a few of my classmates. And they said, oh, that was a beautiful song. And that beautiful song that I played, but how many years ago? Ten. My goodness. Ten years ago, I played a beautiful song, and everybody was wild, and everybody gave me praise. Haven't received a praise for that song since. It's fleeting. But with the Word of God, you grow in grace and in knowledge. What is better? To be praised by a man in which man will pat you on the back until you get uh, so old nobody even cares, and that's usually what happens. What I've noticed, sadly, with a lot of old people is they get to, they get so old that people don't even seem to care for them anymore, don't even want to hang around them. They just sit in their homes alone, drive their jerry chair up and down the street, and then it seems like a very pointless life. But it's not a pointless life if you've had the Word of God, and you could be uh, crippled or whatever once you get older, like Peter was. Peter got to the point where he couldn't even uh, go to the bathroom without somebody helping him. And our Lord prophesied that's the way it would be for him. Yet Peter has rewards today. And at the Bema, he'll receive many more rewards than we will. And those rewards are everlasting. Everlasting rewards. So which is better? Is it better to be praised by man? Or is it better 
when we pass from this earth and go to be face to face with our Lord, to hear our Lord Jesus Christ and to see Him, and to see Him look into our eyes and say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. That is far greater than any compliment or any achievement you can receive on this earth. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the importance of the Word of God so that we can understand that while the earth and everything else will pass away, your Word endures forever so that we might glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.